It's August 11th, 1992, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. You've got to see it to believe it. Who told you you can't have it all? You'll have a ball. So (laughs) opens the official theme song of Bloomington, Minnesota's Mall of America. A mall so large it has its own theme song. (laughs) A mall so large, in fact, that it has been the USA's largest shopping centre since it opened its doors today in history in 1992. I didn't know it had its own theme song and now I want to seek out the theme song for the Broadwalk in Edgware. (laughs) And this thing's opening was so anticipated that an estimated 150,000 shoppers showed up for the grand opening. The crowd grew so large, in fact, that the mall opened its doors earlier than scheduled, just after the freshly mopped floors had been allowed to dry. And partly this was pure curiosity rather than, I suspect, absolute kind of mall-loving fervour. Because even... Even during its construction, it was being called the Mega Mall, and as it went up, the sheer scale of it was so intimidating that some locals began referring to it not as the Mega Mall, but as Megadeth. (laughs) But there wasn't. It's interesting, looking at the contemporary coverage, what you might expect, which was a lot of naysaying. There weren't people Mm. saying, as far as I could see anyway, this is going to be a big white elephant, why are they building this here? There was just that sheer American optimism of the kind that perhaps you could only find in the early 90s when somebody's building a Super Bowl. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) That coming to our city is going to be the biggest mall in North America. And I do think the location of this thing in Minnesota, Bloomington, Minnesota, no disrespect to the people of Bloomington, but there's not that much else going on there, is there? I do think that choice of a place where it is cold in the winter, so an indoor attraction is going to work almost regardless of what it is. And there aren't many Mm. other tourist attractions. You know, this is a major attraction in a big city with a lot of people. was pretty savvy. Yeah, it was modelled on another mall in a cold climate, the West Edmonton Mall across the border from Minnesota in Edmonton, Canada. That opened in stages between 1981 and 1985. And on completion was the largest shopping centre in the world. I mean, depending on who you ask, it is still maybe the largest in North America because it has 836 stores, whereas the Mall of America only has 500 stores. However, it just covers way more acreage than the West Edmonton Mall. And the Mall of America was built by the same people who had developed the West Edmonton Mall, the Canadian-Iranian Germezian brothers. Their family made their fortune selling rugs and then went into development and have since developed a series of mega malls. You know, if you want a gigantic shopping centre built in North America, they are the people to go to. (laughs) Well, part of the appeal for people who lived in the Midwest was that it had these stores that really weren't common in the region. You had Bloomingdale's, you had Nordstrom and Macy's. There weren't outlets like this that you could go to, coupled with the fact that it then also had this indoor, like, seven-acre camp Snoopy theme park, which was, like, this enormous thing that was stocked with 400 trees and 30,000 plants and this mountain and a four-storey waterfall and, like, roller coasters, everything. It sounded utterly incredible. Couple that with then restaurants, bars and clubs. It was like a whole town in this one building. I mean, I don't want to piss on anyone's nostalgia, but for me, a Snoopy theme park does not (laughs) appeal. I mean, it's since become Nickelodeon Universe, which makes more sense. You know, you've got Paw Patrol, you've got SpongeBob. Yeah, Snoopy. I mean, it's like a character based on existentialism. How is that fun for Day Out? (laughs) The creator of Peanuts, Charles Schutz, was from Minnesota, and I feel like that's basically what it was. They said, we better base it on something that's got roots in Minnesota, and they looked at all of the different cartoons and were like... Oh, it's only peanuts. I guess we're doing Camp Snoopy. <laughs> but I mean, the merch makes sense. I'd buy a Snoopy t-shirt. I just wouldn't want to ride a Snoopy roller coaster. What's going to happen? Like, you know, you'd go slowly and reflect on the meaningless of life. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the funny thing is that, that this building was so vast that there was room for all sorts of oddities among the big name brands. So you had this shop that was selling skeletons. You could get human anatomy <laughs> models and other skeletal knickknacks. There was also another shop <laughs> <laughs> That's a great phrase. <laughs> I love the idea that in the sa- under the same roof you can buy a skeletal knickknack, yeah. <laughs> take it to Burger King and then on a log flume. Well, that's, there was this other one that was a sporting equipment store and they had in it a long track for rollerblading and a huge booth for hitting golf balls around. You know, it was like this try before you buy idea, but sort of capitalising on the fact that this thing was vast. 
Yes, really vast. I mean, never mind all the stores. And by the way, it also included in the original lineup the first Lego store Ooh. in America. But just the infrastructure underneath it, 10,000 employees began their jobs on this day and unveiled to accommodate all of the customers, was the world's largest parking lot. Um, It is still the case, and I love this statistic, that 1,700 people a year require assistance from security at the Mall of America because they cannot find their cars. God, unsurprising. There is no central heating in the entirety of that building, which is now 5.6 million square feet. Wow. Um, And that is because it is heated by the volume of people that are inside and the kind of greenhouse effect of having a big glass roof, but also skylights, heat lighting fixtures and solar radiation, Mm. Um, which, I mean, you look at the design now and it looks dated. It looks like it's from the 90s. You know, they can only do so many waterfalls and palm trees to disguise the fact that it, it, it looks a bit 90s now. But they were ahead of the curve on that, weren't they? I mean, they could have easily just put in a massive heating system into Minnesota, but they didn't. They were all features that kind of harken back to what the original vision of the shopping centre was. A guy called Victor Gruen is credited with creating the first ever modern shopping mall, Southdale. Actually, interestingly, also a suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota, which is what Bloomington is. So Almost as if it's cold and there's nothing to do there but shop. <laughs> <laughs> well, his shopping centre was called Southdale, and he envisioned it not as this boxy solar shrine to capitalism, but as a main street for the suburbs. You know, lots of people were living in these very scattered suburban areas that no longer had a natural focus point. And that's what he thought the shopping centre could be. In his vision, it would have churches, medical clinics, the library. And although we tend to picture it as being a land of vast parking lots, Gruen saw the mall as a move towards a less car orientated culture because he thought if you would go somewhere, park up, and then you'd be hanging around in the centre, you'd be doing your shopping, you might go to the dentist, maybe you'd go to church while you were there. That was actually a less car-centric environment than driving downtown from the suburbs and then cruising from store to store without interacting with your fellow citizens at all. He was Mm. a socialist, basically. He was about creating alternative community and then it just got turned into rampant commercialism. And really, huge department stores began being replaced by both one-stop sort of Walmart-like discount chains and then mini strip malls as people were moving away from these big sort of monolithic mega stores. And people were increasingly also shopping by, at the time this seems very quaint, but television and catalogue. But studies showed that they were rarely doing it for pleasure. People wanted stuff in a more functional way, not because they loved the experience of getting it in that sort of peak of consumerist fervour, but rather because they kind of had to get it. And yet, uh, mall culture was sort of American culture, really, wasn't it, throughout the 80s and the early 90s? Partly because Gruen's vision that you explained, Rebecca, just felt so futuristic and different. Walt Disney himself even cited Gruen as his main influence for the ideas behind Epcot. Wow. But also just what was going on in the suburbs. You know, you had white flight from cities during the 1960s and 70s. So there was this customer base of people with cars who wanted to go out who had money, didn't want to go into the inner cities. 1,500 malls were built in the US between 1956 and 2005. And the original vision had got completely diluted. Mm. Victor Gruen said in 1978, I would like to take this opportunity to disclaim paternity once and for all. I refuse to pay alimony for those bastard developments. (laughs) I meant socialist utopia, not this. (laughs) Yeah, and this really was the peak of mall culture. In in 1989, when construction on the Mall of America was just getting underway, 94% of Americans reported visiting a mall at least once a month. In 2023, that number had fallen to 28%, but not necessarily for the reasons you would think. I mean, the decline of mall shopping has obvious explanations, you know, the rise of online shopping being the major one. And that is true. That has obviously had a huge impact. But also a 2023 survey found that almost one third of Americans said that they didn't feel safe visiting a mall, presumably due to high profile mass shootings and terror attacks. And one thing that's really interesting, I thought about the Mall of America, is that as well as a traditional security staff, as you'd expect in any large public venue, the Mall of America employs its own counter-terror unit. They're called the Risk Assessment and Mitigation Mitigation unit. They've got eight full-time members who are trained in detection tactics in Israel. And also to help people find their way back to their cars. <laughs> <laughs> and so another week of retrospecting ends. But next week begins a day early at Club Retrospectors. Join us now to get an exclusive episode every Sunday. Patreon.com slash retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.